So, um, hello everybody, dear colleagues, friends, interested parties. It's a bit unusual to speak to an audience like that. Um, I'd like to welcome you heartily to this inaugural webinar of our new ISHR Cardiovascular Webinar Series, which is hosted by the International Society for Heart Research and its official journal, the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology. My name is uh, Thomas Eschenhagen. I'm a pharmacologist from the University of Hamburg and I'm current president of the ISHR. And you, I hope you see here this gallery of beautiful people. I start with Tish Murphy on, oh yeah, how, how do we do that? Yeah, that's Tish Murphy, immediate past president of ISHR International. And Yoshi Saito, it's, he's below. Uh, he's a, a future uh, uh, president-elect of ISHR, and you should imagine that he's, it's one o'clock in Japan, so he's heroically uh, attending this first seminar, webinar. In the middle of all is uh, Rong Tian, our new editor of the Journal of Molecular Cellular Cardiology, Rong Tian. And uh, on the upper right is our keynote speaker of the day. Many people know him, Eduardo Marban from CEDARS, and he's, he will introduce the secrets of COVID and the heart. And finally, on the left, upper and middle panel are the most important people, Davo Pavlovich and Michael Shetok, because they actually initiated this webinar. So thank, thank, thanks already at this point. So why do we start this webinar series today? Obviously, it's all about COVID, which is for all of us a new and a pretty extreme situation, I think. It seems very different in different countries, but we all are affected heavily. And it's interesting to see that um, the lab work, the lab uh, science is differently affected in different countries from almost normal to more or less complete shutdown. And I think it was in this background that uh, Davo came to this idea. Uh, a, second, uh, a second reason was that at this point, I think nobody knows uh, how long that uh, crisis will last. So it's probably unrealistic as some prominent Western leader said, it's gonna be finished after Eastern. It's probably a bit <laughs> later. We, we think it's gonna be more May, minimum or even, even later. And if you see, for example, China needed only four weeks to cope with the crisis from mid-January to, to uh, well, two months actually, from mid-January to mid-March. Europe is shifted by about four weeks and it's probably take much longer. The US is even more shifted a bit to the right. So in any case, all of you know this, this, this uh, crisis will keep us in a strange situation for long and that's the reason why we thought it's good to create something new. So what can we all do? What can every single person do? I think everybody has his own answer to this. I personally think it's, it's, of course, it's super important to, to act responsible and, and be careful, but also without being panic and panicking. And um, I think also it's important to somehow continue our normal job, our normal work as much as possible, because otherwise the secondary damage will be enormous. And uh, some of us are actually looking uh, specifically what type of science they can uh, contribute here. And it's amazing to see, for example, in circulation, we are flooded by papers about COVID. James CC experiences the same thing. There are many, many initiatives worldwide. First data coming out. I know from several groups, for example, the German Center for Cardiovascular Research, that people start looking at um, systematically what exactly is the influence of ACE inhibitors, ARBs on ACE2. What do viruses do on, for example, uh, IPS myocytes? Interesting question. Is there really a direct effect? Um, many people do single cell sequencing to answer the question, which cells in the body, in the heart, express ACE2? And it's very interesting, actually, these first data. Pericytes seem to be full of uh, ACE2. And uh, others try to, to, to think about studies. I think, um, at least in Germany, we decided to participate in the large five-arm WHO trial, 
and also to do own reg registries. I think all of these things are important. Um, but Davor and Michael Shattock had the great idea to introduce this new series of webinars. And the idea here is simply, I think, science goes on. Our own conference has all been cancelled. Every con conference has been cancelled. And so we thought that this may be a, a welcomed way to still continue scientific exchange and, and discuss about new things, new, new ideas and current uh, work. So the, the main point here is just to share and discuss science in the cardiovascular field, not about COVID. Today is an exception with Eduardo. Uh, I guess it's leaking in, the every, in every discussion, but it's, it's, it's all, overall all about our own science. And that's actually the one and only mission of the ISHR. And uh, we want to do this in this really wonderful uh, context of, of ISHR as an international, truly world spanning uh, family of scientists. And the good thing in this, um, in this format is that it's completely open to everybody. So at present, I don't know how many people are watching, but more than 800, I think, applied or re registered. It's probably more than most of our conferences uh, gather in, 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 in one, for one talk. We designed it fully open access, so it's free for everybody. We don't have to travel. We save a lot of costs. We save the negative impact of traveling on the climate. So it even has some uh, positive aspects, as maybe in general this crisis may have some, at least some, positive aspects. We advertised the, the webinars through our ISHR communication channels, but of course we hope as well to, to reach out to others and to even more people and it seems to, to work. And uh, I think at this point I would just like to thank uh, Davo and Michael for having this great idea. But I also would like to, to thank um, Rong Tiang who immediately said yes, let's go for it. The rest of uh, the leadership, Tish, uh, Leslie, Yoshi, Lee, Arthur, everybody agreed. So I think it was a nice response. We were pretty quick. So here we are, and um, now it's up to all of you as volunteers to put it in life, because I mean, it's not the, the idea that only we as a, let's say established, a little bit older people talk, but that young people use this as an exchange. And I think it's important actually to, to imagine at this point, 800 people worldwide watch this. So young ones, you, you will have an enormous exposure here, uh, more than most abstract. So, so take the chance and uh, use the space in the list. I think the space, uh, the, the list is already pretty busy, but I'm sure there are still places to, 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 to be. It doesn't cost a lot of, a little preparation, but that's about it. And so I hope that this series will have a life, maybe even a life after COVID, which hopefully is over soon. And um, before closing, I would just like to use the opportunity that despite webinars and all these beautiful online tools, we still have conferences. Our main Congress will be the ISHR International Congress in Berlin. This will be June 12 to 15, 2022. Check the website. But of course, there are also the section meetings. Unfortunately, this uh, year, everything was canceled. The American, the European, I don't know actually about the Japanese, but I heard the Aust Australasian has been canceled. Everything's canceled. But next year, certainly there will be um, all of these conferences. They're really nice. It's a beautiful place to uh, have also personal exchange. So please consider ISHR. Maybe be a member, and it's uh, everything is living from membership in the respective sections, and um, so please think about it. And with this, I would like to introduce uh, two speakers. First, uh, tomorrow, just a reminder: the first regular webinar will be given by Manuel Meyer, a proteomics expert from KCL in London. It's going to be certainly very good. He's a super speaker. And now, um, for the first um, 
inaugural webinar, we have the privilege to get Eduardo Marban uh, talking about the secrets of COVID and the heart. And uh, I, I know that he has given this uh, or similar lecture already in, uh, in CEDARS, and it's been a big success. I think most of you know uh, Professor Marban. He has been not only a very uh, established electrophysiologist and editor of circulation research, but over the last 10 years, has been very prominent in the stem cell field, cardiospheres, and um, I think many of us are curious to listen to what you have to say to COVID and the heart, Eduardo. So thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk. Before doing so, I think uh, we could use a chance for Q&A, and Davor has a secret how to do that. So thank you very much for listening, and enjoy the rest of the webinar series. So, so thank you, Thomas. Um, I have tried to put up a couple of slides whilst you were talking. I'm not sure if that was successful, but <laughs> I just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, for, for the attendees, can you please use the Q&A in order to ask questions? Otherwise, you can chat amongst them yourselves using the chat um, section. And uh, I will also try and put up one more time share my screen and put up a, um, an advert for, and hopefully you can see this now. I don't know if you can. So uh, today we've got Professor Eduardo Marban, um, and tomorrow we've got Manuel Maya uh, speaking at the same time. And obviously for those of you that are interested, please you can sign up using this particular link for the ISHR and I will, stop now and I will probably let everyone else talk. So how are you going to deal with the q and I see many chats and two q and A. I ah, okay, so can, shall, shall I just uh, 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 read them? Yes, of course, yes. Okay, so Rafael Darioli asks, are you planning to share recording link later? Would be great. I think the answer is yes, at least of the lecture of Eduardo, right? Yes, so uh, Professor Eduardo Marban has kindly agreed to, to have this webinar recorded and we will share it uh, via a link uh, that you can also view at your own pleasure whenever you want, but also we, we've created a ISHR YouTube webinars channel so uh, he's kindly agreed to have that hosted there as well. Um, so, so those will be made available to the, to the attendees. Okay, so there are many, many uh, chats. It's mainly one, about tec technology, technique. One correction that came across that's probably worth making is that um, not, all the, uh, not all the section meetings have been canceled. Some have oh. been canceled. And there was one from, I think the Australian section meeting has been postponed to, I think December. And the North American section meeting has been postponed to August. And it's on the website. So, so just a correction. Oh, okay. Okay. I think also the January have, section but, of the will have, have just December, been postponed. So. Okay, sorry, yeah. So, so don't want to mislead at people. The, 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 some, some are postponed. Actually, the European section meeting in Torino has just been shifted by exactly one year. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, again, one should probably check, but I think the North American section meeting is August um, 18th to 21st, I think is correct, but um, Pepe or uh, Gary can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So I think Eduardo now, from what I can see, you're good to go. Um, you're your image hopefully will appear once you start speaking in the, in the box next to your slides. And uh, perhaps the attendees can let me know if that's not the case because it's the first time we're running. And so just to ensure that that is the case. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so this morning, um, morning here in California anyway, I'll be talking about COVID-19 and the heart. And just uh, by way of putting this in some context uh, in terms of how rapidly this field is evolving, uh, 
Uh, the first publication on PubMed, if you simply search on COVID and heart, appeared on February 18th. And as of yesterday, we were up around 49. And this morning, it's 59. And so there's 10 papers on this that I haven't read. Uh, and this is only on PubMed. If you look on MedArchive and BioArchive, there's many, many more preprints that have been uh, deposited there. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, if you just ser uh, search on COVID alone, there were 1,712 citations. This is all since late January when the um, term was first coined by the World Health Organization. So um, this brings up one important disclaimer. Um, as comprehensive as I've attended, attempted to be, this is a bit of a time capsule in terms of knowledge as of uh, yesterday. Um, secondly, um, almost all the world's scholarly literature on this topic originates from China because they obviously got a head start on the, um, on the epidemic. Uh, and um, because of that, some of the generalizations, especially the epidemiological ones, may or may not apply to other countries with different uh, demographics and uh, ethnicities. Uh, so um, having said that, um, I'll uh, proceed to, to share with you sort of the state of the art of knowledge on this disease and how it, uh, how it affects the cardiovascular system. Uh, another disclaimer at this point is that almost all the literature so far is uh, clinical. Uh, there's very little by way of uh, basic science uh, right now on COVID-19, at least as it has to do with the heart. Many, many, many questions that have emerged, and I'm sure this field will be revolutionized in terms of the scholarly um, knowledge of uh, what's going on. But right now, as I said, um, this is what we have. So uh, in thinking about uh, COVID, of course, the first step in uh, the disease is uh, infection. And the infection uh, presumably happens by attachment of the coronavirus to um, ACE2 receptors uh, in the lung epithelium. And after that, uh, there's a massive replication of the virus. And a stage one, which is characterized by um, response to the virus in a relatively stereotypical fashion relative to other vi viral illnesses with some exceptions that I'll note in going along. Um, then within a few days uh, in patients who go on to be uh, critically ill, uh, there's a pulmonary phase where the clinical picture is dominated by uh, dyspnea, hypoxia, and um, clinical features that are really dominated by the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And um, often these uh, patients end up being intubated and always end up requiring supplemental oxygen when they're critically ill. Uh, the third stage, interestingly, becomes more of a systemic hyperinflammation picture in which the, do the host response dominates the entire uh, scenario. Uh, and here, um, our emerging concept is that there's friendly fire of the immune system, uh, which also hits a lot of vital organs, including the heart, uh, perhaps the kidneys, and certainly even secondary effects on the lung. Now, if you look um, at the uh, um, signature laboratory abnormalities, uh, something that is uh, very apparent early on, uh, indeed, uh, we see it in, on admission to the hospital, initial presentation already, is lymphocytopenia. There's not an absolute uh, decrease in the overall white count. Um, it tends to be normal or slightly depressed, but the, um, if you specifically do a differential and look at uh, lymphocytes, they're depleted relatively. And the depletion of uh, lymphocytes, as I'll show you, is prognostically important and also tells us something about the um, uh, possibility of um, recovery as well as the time course of the illness. Uh, during the pulmonary phase, you see highly abnormal uh, chest CT and uh, chest x-rays uh, indicative of acute respiratory distress syndrome with a characteristic kind of ground glass appearance that's described uh, in radiographs. And, and then uh, in stage three, there's elevated and inflammatory cardiac and cardiac biomarkers, but there's substantial overlap among these um, uh, various phases and some patients can present with absolutely all of these uh, and others can present only with the lymphocytopenia. So um, rather than repeat 
uh, the kinds of graphs that you can typically find on um, news channels and so on, uh, just showing you where the disease is. I thought I'd reflect on some very interesting uh, genetic epidemiology that's been done, that was published recently in this citation. Uh, and uh, on the left-hand panel here, you see uh, something that I think explains why this has become a pandemic. On the x-axis is the basic reproduction number, R0, and this is simply um, the number of patients on average that are infected by a given index patient. So if it were less than one, as it often is in the seasonal flu, the illness would not propagate. It would be uh, self-extinguishing. Anything greater than one, by definition, means it's spreading. And for COVID-19, that number, uh, as best we know it right now, is between two and two and a half. That's, that's one thing to bear in mind. And then on the y-axis is the case fatality rate. Uh, and you know, if you look all the way up here at Ebola, in which half of the infected patients die, uh, that would be a self-extinguishing disease as well, because you could isolate those patients with simple public health measures. They die, and uh, in so doing, they don't propagate the disease beyond a very local kind of population. So COVID-19 sits somewhere between uh, the uh, pandemic of uh, 1918 for influenza and SARS, which uh, was uh, luckily contained in the 2002-2003 uh, epidemic. Uh, but because it's got a, a relatively uh, high r naught and a relatively low case fatality rate, it's kind of a perfect recipe for a pandemic. Many of these patients we now realize are fairly uh, asymptomatic. Uh, if you look in the middle panel at the symptomatic uh, case fatality risk versus age, and what this means is if you uh, have symptoms, how likely are you to, uh, to die? Um, we see that there's really a monotonic increase beginning in the fifth decade of life and uh, the, the sixth decade of life, and then uh, rising continuously uh, so, such that the Patients who are uh, above age 79 have a very significant increase in symptomatic case fatality. But uh, lurking beneath the surface is, I think, a very interesting finding. And that is that uh, among those people who are infected, how many are actually symptomatic? And this is all normalized to um, a value uh, in the uh, 30s. Uh, so below the 30s, there's uh, uh, an increase which is palpable already in uh, the group between 20 and 29. And this increases monotonically uh, well before the symptomatic case fatality rate does. And this is telling us something probably about the um, adaptive immunity response to the uh, virus and how it uh, manifests as a function of age, as does the symptomatic case fatality rate. But this actually seems to exhibit some kind of threshold phenomenon. The overall probability of dying after developing symptoms of COVID-19 inferred from these data is about 1.4%, which is much lower than the crude confirmed case fatality risk, probably um, uh, simply reflecting the fact that um, the uh, testing is so incomplete. So what am I gonna tell you today? Uh, some simple uh, bullets. First of all, the immune overreaction uh, kills people. Uh, secondly, ACE2 binds the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, but its role in uh, COVID-19 is so far otherwise vague. Cardiac involvement is prominent. Uh, in therapeutics, there's a lot of pseudoscience, hype, and wishful thinking, and much more of that than evidence-based medicine. Uh, and finally, uh, there may be long-term sequelae of infection. Um, first of all, uh, let's consider the relationship of lymphocytopenia and uh, T-cell depletion to disease uh, progression. If you look at these uh, data published uh, in, the, in JAMA and in uh, Lancet respectively, uh, you can find that um, the uh, time course of the white blood cell count, overall white blood cell count in survivors tends to be fairly flat. Uh, and in fact, is either normal or somewhat uh, depressed. But in patients who go on to, uh, to, to die, uh, that becomes uh, a, a relative uh, granulocytosis, as you can see here on the right-hand panel. This is an increase in neutrophils. On the other hand, if you look at the lymphocyte count, you can see that survivors show some uh, lymphocytopenia uh, to begin with. Um, it's very common to see lymphocytopenia as a presenting laboratory abnormality 
of COVID-19. And if you don't have quick access to the, um, to the test, uh, simply doing a uh, CBC and differential can give you a clue. Survivors tend to hover around uh, normal or just below, uh, whereas non-survivors not only show an early depletion, but go on not to recover their lymphocyte counts. And this is also seen in the separate cohort uh, here where survivors have a progressive increase in their lymphocyte counts, whereas non-survivors don't recover and in fact show a uh, progressive depression. If you go back to the SARS uh, um, epidemic of 2002 and 2003, where there's uh, a little bit of science that emerged after that, uh, and um, the kind of science that we haven't really had time to do yet with the uh, COVID epidemic, you find that um, by looking at uh, electron micrographs of infected uh, cells, uh, that many white blood cells contain coronavirus-like inclusion bodies, uh, which are seen uh, here. But if you look at which ones do so the most, uh, granulocytes are only 3% positive. Monocytes, which are macrophage precursors, are almost 30% positive. But over half of the lymphocytes show these uh, inclusion bodies. So there must be uh, at least a hint here that the most vulnerable uh, cells to SARS-CoV infection and presumably to SARS-CoV infection, the genomes are uh, almost identical, um, are uh, the T cells. And if you look at the clinical course uh, during the illness, and this was again in the SARS epidemic, uh, total T cells tend to be depressed in patients with SARS and specifically seems to be a decrease in helper T cells, which uh, are very important for modulating the uh, later immune response. Uh, whereas uh, cytotoxic T cells are somewhat less depressed. What about uh, systemic inflammation and cytokine storm? Well, um, here's uh, one of the cytokines that we associate with uh, uh, cytokine storm interleukin-6. Uh, and uh, if you look differentially at the, and this is retrospective data, but it seems to hold up uh, as we look uh, now prospectively in our series and others, uh, the survivors have a flat uh, interleukin-6 uh, curve, whereas in non-survivors, interleukin-6 is elevated and progressively gets more elevated over the time course of this uh, fatal illness. Uh, likewise, uh, another uh, somewhat less specific uh, biomarker of um, uh, systemic inflammation, serum ferritin, seems to dichotomize between survivors and non-survivors. Uh, and if you look uh, here at... Um, uh, the uh, patterns for C-reactive protein, perhaps the least um, uh, specific of all the markers of systemic inflammation or the most general, uh, there's a highly significant difference uh, in the course of the illness between uh, those who go on to uh, die and those who go on to be discharged with a very high CRP and those who are, in whom the case was fatal. Uh, and likewise, uh, reproducing in this other series, the data seen here for interleukin-6 as a uh, an apparent prognostic indicator uh, of mortality. Um, there's no, um, uh, when we look at, so let's jump now to the whole ACE2 um, uh, basis of, of infection in uh, SARS-CoV and its role in uh, cardiovascular morbidity. There's certainly a theoretical basis here for susceptibility differences among uh, populations, maybe even in age, but it's not really even clear whether high ACE2 to begin with is a good thing or a bad thing. It may be that uh, it's relatively protective because the virus itself depletes uh, ACE2. Uh, and uh, it may also determine the pattern of infection given relative expression patterns in different tissues. But there's really um, no data demonstrating benefits or detriments of renin and angiotensin and aldosterone system antagonists uh, just yet, uh, other than some preprints that have appeared in the uh, Chinese uh, literature on uh, on the uh, archives. Uh, but we do know for a fact that SARS-CoV-2, like its uh, precursor SARS-CoV, uh, can infect host cells via the ACE2 receptor. And now even at atomic resolution, we know uh, how the SARS-CoV spike uh, domains interact with human uh, ACE2. And how might this affect uh, ventricular function? Well, this is all conjectural, but we do know from previous work on uh, ACE2 knockout mice, no infection here, just knocked out, knockout of the ACE2 gene, they develop poor left ventricular function. Uh, 
And we also know that uh, SARS-CoV, at least, and I think recently also in the archives, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, lower the expression of uh, ACE2. So if you put two and two together, these findings are compatible with the notion that SARS-CoV inhibits ACE2 and thereby depresses LB function. But there's no corollary data yet in humans and only some preliminary data that have been published with SARS-CoV-2. So what's the controversy of um, uh, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system antagonists in COVID? It doesn't take uh, much creativity to imagine that if you use a small molecule that interferes with the function of uh, ACE, that these might modulate somehow the propensity to infection. And certainly in animal models, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, have been shown to increase the expression of ACE2. So this leads to the speculated and completely theoretical risk of increased uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. But uh, as I've mentioned, um, ACE2 expression may actually be a good thing. So this could cut both ways. Uh, and um, it's possible indeed that uh, the directionality of these presumed uh, prejudices might be wrong. Um, the, certainly the role of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in COVID-19 patients is uncertain. And all the major societies to date um, recommend just continuing the present therapy in patients uh, who are well controlled for their hypertension and or heart failure uh, with uh, such drugs. Cardiac involvement is prominent. We wouldn't be having this uh, seminar if it weren't. Um, it's a major cause of death. Uh, the elevations of troponin and I and BNP are common and associated with a poor outcome. But the extent of genuine myocarditis so far is uh, unclear and probably somewhat exaggerated. Uh, if we look at the causes of death overall in patients with confirmed uh, COVID-19, a full 40%, this is again from the Chinese epidemic, are attributed to either exclusively to myocardial damage or heart failure, which actually accounts in this series for a full 33% of deaths, with another 7% being cardiorespiratory for a total of 40% uh, implication of the heart in mortality. Um, and we do know for sure that biomarkers of cardiac injury are associated with increased mortality. Witness uh, here the association of cardiac troponin and I uh, in um, patients who died versus uh, those who were discharged. Uh, likewise, the time course of uh, TNI uh, is ever increasing in patients who uh, do not survive uh, as opposed to survivors. Um, and um, uh, likewise, uh, we know that those patients who have some evidence of cardiac injury have a poor survival relative to those without evidence of uh, cardiac injury. One caveat with these findings is um, that this may simply be an association rather than a causal link. And this may simply reflect the overwhelming systemic inflammation and um, a troponin leak on that basis as opposed to genuine primary cardiac illness. So the mechanisms of cardiac injury do now include, uh, for sure, the secondary effect that I was just talking about, where um, hyperinflammation uh, has effects on the heart that include elevated biomarkers and perhaps uh, clinical manifestations of arrhythmias, uh, increased propensity to acute coronary syndromes, uh, uh, conjectural and not yet demonstrated, uh, and uh, both heart failure preserved ejection fraction and low-level myocarditis or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and fulminant myocarditis. The mechanisms also involve uh, direct myocardial injury. At least this has been shown in uh, the propensity of SARS-CoV-2 to actually directly infect cardiac myocytes uh, has been argued to be the case and has been shown uh, in, some, uh, in some cases. Uh, and this, um, in some cases of um, my verified myocarditis. Uh, and uh, certainly respiratory failure and hypoxemia can indirectly uh, depress cardiac function as uh, the membership of the society will uh, well appreciate. So um, how prevalent is myocardial injury? Well, uh, if you look at uh, one uh, case series here, um, at least sometime during the uh, illness, uh, troponin and T uh, values were uh, elevated uh, over normal. And in another series, uh, 
those um, looking at uh, biomarker, uh, collective biomarkers, including troponin I and troponin T, uh, about 20% of uh, patients uh, here were argued to have um, some cardiac injury during the, uh, during the course of the illness. But the number of autopsy specimens is uh, very, very small. Uh, and certainly the number of patients that have um, inflammatory infiltrates with cardiomyocyte necrosis where it's documented is a very, uh, very small. Uh, the number of case reports for fulminant myocarditis can be counted on, on the digits of one hand. Uh, and uh, so subclinical myocarditis may be common. The true incidence is so far unknown, but fulminant myocarditis is possible, uh, but at least so far quite rare. What about hypertension um, and hypotension? Uh, when we first learned of the um, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, epidemic, uh, one of the first uh, major papers on this argued that pre a presenting sign of patients who went on to need intensive care in the uh, Chinese uh, uh, cohort and from Wuhan, uh, they were actually hypertensive, which as you as those of you who have ever been sick or those of you who have ever taken care of uh, critically ill patients is quite bizarre. Uh, critically ill patients tend to come in hypotensive, not hypertensive. And so this made us wonder collectively whether SARS-CoV-2 might cause hypertension or whether uh, perhaps hypertensive patients are at greater risk for um, increased viral load. But it turns out that at least in the US literature, um, it's much more common to present with low blood pressure and a requirement for vasopressors. And indeed in uh, our series uh, here at uh, Cedars-Sinai, which collectively now involves several hundred patients, there's no increase in um, blood pressure in patients who are critically ill and in fact, uh, a general decrease. What about the risk of acute myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndromes? Uh, well, there's certainly good reason to expect that it might happen. Uh, there seems to be a, um, a hyperthrombotic kind of phenotype in uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, infected patients, um, consistent with the fact that there's a systemic uh, hyperinflammatory response. But if you look at D-dimer levels, which uh, basically are uh, products of a clotting reaction and measure them in the blood, you can see that they're quite normal uh, in patients who survive, but very elevated in non-survivors and progressively so with an increase in the illness. Which brings about uh, a long standing literature of many decades uh, of the interface uh, between inflammation and thrombosis. Among the contributing and predisposing factors to thrombosis uh, from inflammation include um, uh, endothelial and smooth muscle cell activation, Macrophages, of course, are known to be activated and tissue factor expression increased in atheromatous plaques. And platelets are activated with additional production of pro-inflammatory mediators. Um, all of these would tend to be pro-thrombotic uh, uh, contributors. And certainly in prior uh, epidemics of respiratory infections with influenza B or influenza A, RSV, and other viruses, uh, there seems to be a, a higher incidence of acute myocardial infarction within seven days of infection with the ranges of risk ranging from about uh, 2.7 to 10. Uh, but the true incidence of acute coronary syndrome and acute myocardial infarction in the COVID epidemic is currently unknown. What we've heard from our colleagues, not only in China, but also in Italy and uh, Spain uh, and so far here in the United States is that there is not a big rush for um, cardiology consults related to acute cardiac ischemia. Uh, arrhythmias seem to be found, although they're very poorly characterized and they can be tachycardias, bradycardias, or even uh, sudden cardiac death um, and asystole. Um, here is one uh, very uh, relatively rudimentary characterization, heart palpitations, not really very helpful. Many patients present with a uh, tachycardia, perhaps just reflecting the severity of illness. This was the admission electrocardiogram of a 31-year-old in Wuhan who presented with multi-system failure, got uh, intensively treated and ended up being discharged uh, to home. Uh, in another series, uh, arrhythmias uh, tend to be more common in, uh, or more prevalent in patients who were admitted to the ICU as opposed to uh, those who were not. 
uh, but these arrhythmias were uh, uncharacterized. Um, so uh, therapeutics has gotten a lot of uh, attention in the uh, lay press. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, there's uh, much more in the way of uh, wishful thinking and hype than there is uh, evidence-based medicine, although slowly some controlled trials uh, are emerging that hopefully will serve as uh, guideposts uh, as we um, have more experience with the uh, pandemic. I'm not going to say anything uh, about anti-IL-6 or anti-IL-6 receptor antibodies other than the fact that they're being used off-label in uh, COVID-19 patients with anecdotally some great success. Uh, but um, let me turn our attention to um, the antimalarials, uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, with and without the uh, antibacterial agent, azithromycin, uh, as well as uh, some other uh, drugs that are in development, uh, rindisivir, a nucleoside uh, analog initially developed for Ebola, uh, where it wasn't particularly effective, but now being tested um, in uh, patients with COVID, uh, antivirals, and corticosteroids. Uh, so um, the whole uh, uh, kind of um, uh, fascination with the antimalarials began actually well before uh, the COVID epidemic where in vitro uh, tests had shown uh, some uh, efficacy against a number of other viral illnesses, including influenza. But uh, clinical trials uh, tended to show absolutely no benefit. Nevertheless, Early on in the course of the uh, epidemic, uh, hydroxychloroquine was tested in vitro on uh, SARS-CoV-2, where it was uh, argued to inhibit uh, infection in vitro. Then um, in, on March 3rd, a, a randomized clinical trial showed no differences in viral loads or clinical recovery between hydroxychloroquine and control groups. But the plot thickened uh, with a, a much hyped, uh, very controversial article showing uh, decreased viral loads and rapid viral clearance in a subset of patients treated with both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in a very poorly controlled small study from Marseille, which was then compounded by a larger uh, study with no comparison group from the same group, uh, showing uh, an apparent improvement of length of stay and contagiousness relative to basically a historical index. Incredibly uh, controversial. But the uh, plot thickened even more uh, just a couple of days ago when a preprint appeared with a 62-patient um, series out of Wuhan, randomized one-to-one -one between hydroxychloroquine and, uh, and uh, conventional care. And the uh, conclusion was that there was a shorter time to clinical recovery in the hydroxychloroquine group. Again, a very collectively, a very small world literature upon which many tens of thousands of patients are being treated off-label with these drugs that incidentally are known to increase the uh, QT interval and cause a sudden cardiac death. Um, if you look at uh, lopinavir and ritonavir, which is a cocktail that was uh, developed uh, for possible use uh, in uh, AIDS um, and showed in vitro uh, activity against SARS-CoV-2, uh, this was the first uh, placebo-controlled trial to appear in the literature and showed absolutely no benefit, either in terms of clinical improvement or in terms of viral load. So there's a lesson in this uh, trial, which is probably the best one so far in the uh, COVID literature. Um, and uh, the message is uh, early enthusiasm needs to be tempered by a long-term uh, reality. Um, in uh, what about corticosteroids? Um, certainly data from uh, prior viral epidemics don't support uh, corticosteroid use in all of these uh, previous epidemics listed here. The outcomes were uh, either neutral or uh, deleterious, and uh, many uh, side effects occurred. Um, having said that, uh, SARS, in SARS-CoV-2 infected patients, uh, corticosteroids are used not infrequently in critically ill patients, uh, but what we do know is that there's no apparent mortality benefit and uh, the corticosteroids only worsen the lymphocytopenia. So we can't recommend them for, uh, for your routine use. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about emerging uh, uh, trials of cell therapy. Uh, and uh, this is motivated by um, a um, general thought uh, 
that um, if you have cells that may be anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, and may uh, act on uh, uh, T lymphocytes, that perhaps uh, in a way never intended from the initial use in regenerative medicine, such um, mechanisms may be helpful. And we've started such a trial uh, in, uh, at Cedar sinai uh, which uh, uses uh, the kind of cells we've been interested in for some time, cardiosphere-derived cells. But it's important to say that there's a very small literature that's already been deposited on preprints using mesenchymal stem cells in China, and I'm aware of at least four other trials that are incipient in the Western world uh, that uh, use other cell types. But this is the rationale for our study, uh, which uh, I'll tell you about later. Uh, the recipe for making CDCs is, uh, is well known and is published and has been reproduced in over um, uh, 200 laboratories uh, or in over 200 publications from more than 55 independent laboratories worldwide. We now appreciate the mechanisms of action to include um, cardiomyocyte uh, survival being enhanced, uh, anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory effects mediated by uh, secreted extracellular vesicles. And in clinical trials of uh, CDCs, uh, which now uh, have involved uh, over 200 uh, patients uh, worldwide, um, there seems to be um, signs of uh, bioactivity, disease-modifying bioactivity, although not always the disease-modifying bioactivity that was anticipated at the beginning of the trial. For example, in the All-Star trial, uh, which was uh, pre-designed to show a decrease in a scar size by magnetic resonance imaging, there was overall placebo-controlled and, and double-blinded. There was overall no decrease in scar size, but there was a significant at the 0.01 level decrease in end systolic volume and end diastolic volume and in uh, serum biomarkers of heart failure, specifically NT pro BMP. So why even think of using this in COVID? Well, if you think of uh, SARS-CoV-2, we don't have any reason to believe that the, the um, CDCs or their exosomes would alter epithelial entry and epithelial entry and destruction and direct infection of uh, leukocytes. Um, we're testing that idea right now, actually, in collaboration with a BSL-3 lab uh, locally. But um, what we do know is that once the, the inflammatory cycle gets going, regulatory T cells are involved as are effector T cells, macrophages, uh, where the macrophage function and enhanced nephrocytosis might play an important cleanup role, especially in intense inflammatory deposits like those in the lung. Um, systemic cytokines are elevated, leading to systemic inflammation and multi-organ dysfunction. And at every one of these uh, choke points, um, there's uh, evidence for effects of CDCs on pro-inflammatory targets consistent with effects that have been quite uniformly positive in a number of preclinical models, ranging from myocardial ischemia and myocarditis to muscular dystrophy, different types of, uh, of heart failure, senescence, and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and so far, clinically, um, the um, a company, Capricor, for which I had a disclosure in my slide as being a founder, um, has uh, gone all the way through phase two with the clinical program for Duchenne muscular dystrophy being the most advanced and some recent uh, very promising data from their ongoing uh, placebo-controlled uh, clinical trial of uh, boys and young men uh, with DMD. Uh, but uh, to show you just uh, some tantalizing new evidence as to why these uh, agents, uh, CDCs and their exosomes might be particularly uh, helpful in COVID. Um, we now know from uh, data that was published uh, recently from uh, Lillian Gregorian when she was in my lab. She's now in the front lines of taking care of COVID ill patients in uh, uh, Madrid. Um, but she found in uh, accelerated aging models in rats with uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction these animals get an increase in IL-6, for example, which is attenuated by um, a CDC uh, treatment. Uh, and um, in unpublished data um, from Shah Akhmerov in my lab, uh, the um, T cell proliferation as well as T cell activation is increased by exposure to CDCs in a transwell culture or to their exosomes directly. And not only do CDCs increase the proliferation 
of uh, regulatory T cells, but they also uh, increase IL-10 production by uh, regulatory T cells, but don't activate uh, pro-inflammatory effector T cells. Uh, and um, again, in uh, unpublished work from uh, by Shah in my lab, um, CDC exosomes um, are effective apparently in a uh, model of autoimmune uh, myocarditis, echoing uh, prior work from uh, Costas Meliaris's lab in Greece, uh, in which he published uh, effectiveness of CDCs themselves in a very similar model of experimental automyocarditis in rodents. You can see. There's not only benefits on uh, ventricular function, but also apparently on QT intervals and a decrease in uh, inflammatory severity based on histopathology. So this all leads to the CS-Cube trial, CS-Cube being an acronym for CDCs for cytokine storm and COVID syndrome. Uh, and the um, inclusion criteria uh, for this trial, uh, which is an open label observational study at this point, you know, confirmed COVID-19 and critically ill patients, and they all have to have lymphocytopenia plus at least one from the menu of elevated IL-6, troponin, and myoglobin, or CRP. Uh, the intervention here is intravenous uh, allogeneic CDCs, what the company has called CAP-1002. Uh, and uh, we know uh, from prior preclinical studies uh, that the intravenous formulation uh, works uh, well, at least in Duchenne muscular dystrophy models. And there's uh, evidence from the uh, ongoing HOPE-2 trial, uh, interim analysis thereof, that uh, IV uh, uh, CDCs are efficacious in um, several parameters of not only cardiac, but also skeletal muscle, uh, in halting uh, progression of skeletal muscle uh, weakness in that uh, setting, uh, and also uh, in improving uh, cardiac function. Uh, and we're going to give these, or we are giving these weekly, uh, up to four doses. So far, we've recruited two patients, one of whom has been uh, treated uh, once and uh, the other of whom has already gotten two doses. Uh, both of those patients uh, are doing quite well uh, and were critically ill when given uh, the doses. Um, the exploratory, the outcomes are all exploratory so far. We're going to be looking at mortality, length of stay in the intensive care unit, the need for escalation of support, and a lot of uh, biomarkers in collaboration with uh, Jenny Van Eyck, as well as for discovery purposes, as well as uh, conventional uh, biomarkers. Um, and um, even though I've told you we've recruited two patients and they're doing well, uh, another sort of um, editorial comment that I'll make at this point is that we found here a much lower mortality for critically ill patients overall than is described in the literature. Um, I think if you can give these patients outstanding medical intensive care. Um, they often recover, even very elderly patients do. Uh, so that in our experience of treating um, over 50 such patients uh, here at Cedar sinai we've had uh, only uh, three deaths uh, and one of them was a 102 year old patient. So um, that's a cautionary note to say that even though our patients treated with CDC so far, has shown improvement that a placebo-controlled trial is, is eventually going to be necessary to be sure that there's actually net benefit from this intervention, although there's good reason to believe that it might work. So what about long-term sequelae of the disease? Here, the literature is very sparse and is largely dependent on what uh, little work there was on SARS-CoV-2 SARS virus uh, survivors, uh, SARS-CoV virus survivors from the SARS epidemic of 2002-2003. Uh, the total numbers in that epidemic were relatively uh, small, just in the thousands. And so the number of survival studies is quite limited. But so far, what uh, there seems to be is some realization that there is, and this is a conjectural slide, but it's consistent with everything we know about the SARS, uh, in fact, the SARS epidemic and what we know so far about the uh, COVID epidemic is that there's an acute phase, which was summarized in, in the first slide uh, that I showed, um, and the first schematic slide of progression of the disease. But once that's over, the patients who go on to recover, of course, uh, decrease their disease severity over time. Uh, they go into a convalescent phase that isn't rigorously defined, but we sort of think of it from, uh, let's say, uh, day 21 or so in the illness when patients begin to be uh, ready for discharge once their virus is cleared. Um, through uh, several months, perhaps, uh, 
And during this convalescent phase, um, what we found is that there are cases of delayed myocarditis and even patients whom we think are ready to go home who uh, suffer asystole while uh, walking the halls. So just a cautionary note that we may not be out of the woods even after the virus uh, has apparently been cleared. And then uh, from the um, SARS literature, there are uh, reports of persistent uh, hyperlipidemia and pulmonary fibrosis and hypertension uh, as sequelae of um, SARS um, uh, COV infection. So much remains to be learned here, and the question marks are purposefully put, it, put in to indicate that our knowledge base is quite limited. So just to summarize, uh, immune overreaction uh, kills people. I've told you a little bit about ACE2 and its uh, critical role in infection, but otherwise um, unclear role in cardiovascular uh, disease progression. I've uh, mentioned uh, that cardiac involvement is prominent, talked about emerging therapeutics as well as uh, the controversies therein, and uh, at least sensitized you to the possibility of long-term sequelae. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Shah Akhmarov for helping uh, put together this presentation and for his unpublished work that I showed. Ahmed Ibrahim, uh, Jeff Dekudo, and Russell Rogers are the other three members of the uh, COVID task force within my laboratory, and Raj Makar, who is the principal investigator of the uh, CS Cube trial. And even though we have no specific funding for COVID, this is the history of recent funding in my laboratory uh, listed here. Uh, and uh, just finally, this is where I'm uh, broadcasting from, uh, literally from this point in this building. Uh, this is a rare day in uh, Los Angeles where there were actually clouds in the sky. Uh, and um, this building, which is the Advanced uh, Health Sciences Pavilion, is shown here in the aerial map. Um, some of our laboratories are on the top floor of this building, including uh, Jenny Van Eyck's and Robbie Gottlieb's. Uh, my own laboratories are in this other research building here, and this U-shaped structure is the main uh, clinical hospital with the ICUs being in the Saperstein Tower and some of the um, uh, cath labs and ORs being distributed over in this building as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, help me get so, so thank you very much, Eduardo. I will just um, enable a, a gallery view again. And, oh, I think that's enabled already, so. These are the Q&As. Oh, okay. So I'm hoping that everybody can, can see all the, all the people in the, in the, uh, on the panel. All right, so. Um... So if you want to answer questions, there is a Q&A box. Uh, hopefully you can see it at the bottom of your screen. If you click on it. Okay. You will be able to see all the questions, you can scroll down. There's 21 questions. I should also say that we were running on average about 760 attendees, um, plus a substantial panel. So I guess we're, we're at around 770, 780 uh, people that, that actually tuned in today. So quite impressive. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll summarize the questions uh, as I see them and give a, a verbal answer. Um, the first question by Mauro Costa is, what are the possible correlations between RAS system changes mediated by ACE2 modulation by the virus? And there I have to say, I, have no, I don't know anything other than what I uh, said, which is very little. Um, Lucy Carrier um, says, uh, asks, um, an interesting question. She notes that the ACE2 gene is located on chromosome X, uh, and are there any data showing a difference between men and women? So it's been speculated that men are more susceptible to ACE, uh, to uh, SARS COVID, um, in, uh, SARS CoV2 infection, and the COVID syndrome because they have a relative hemiallelic insufficiency and lower levels of ACE2. We males having only one copy of the gene. Uh, and females having two given the, uh, the dual X chromosome. But um, so far, um, the correlation between genotype and phenotype is um, not very clear. Uh, and uh, certainly, um, if high ACE2 levels are protective, uh, 
that argument is at least um, from first principles consistent with some predilection to worse disease in, in men. Um, Sylvia Fanti asks, how is a myocarditis, di myocarditis diagnosed in patients with COVID? This is a non-trivial question because a lot of what is inferred as myocarditis is simply uh, due to biomarker elevations. It's incredibly difficult just technically to get high quality echocardiograms in these patients to see if there's a, a, a ventricular dysfunction, um, both um, because of staff exposure to uh, a critically ill patient, as well as from the uh, personal protective equipment making it quite difficult to get all the, and the intubation of the patient uh, and uh, the patient's relative immobility, making it quite different, quite difficult to get uh, rigorous views of the heart. So you can imagine the, the echocardiography literature on uh, COVID uh, patients is really uh, almost non-existent. Um, so um, in a few flagrant cases where the patient clinically is in heart failure, uh, burbling with uh, hemoptysis and uh, every indication, uh, not only of um, uh, radiography, not only of um, ARDS, but also superimposed heart failure. Um, those are the ones who make it into the case report literature, but what I said is uh, true, which is that the number of such confirmed cases is vanishingly small. And finally, endomyocardial biopsy, which is uh, usually uh, or often um, given, uh, often done to verify the diagnosis histologically uh, has never been done to my knowledge in a patient with uh, COVID-19. Uh, um, <coughs> Manish Kala makes an observation that blood pressure observation uh, may be related to the delayed presentation in the US cohort after a period of isolation. And uh, it's noted that, uh, that his experience in the UK uh, is similar, whereas in China, admissions were earlier due to cohorting in specific uh, facilities. This is more of a comment than a question, but I thought it was worth sharing. Um, Michelle Russo asks if there's a correlation between Tregs and uh, COVID-19 infection, and should their anti-inflammatory effect protect against the viral infection? So, so far, this is a consistency argument. We certainly know that Tregs um, T cells in general and, and probably T regs were depressed in SARS. Uh, and there's no data yet that we know of specifically on T regs in uh, COVID 19, but certainly everything we know about them biologically uh, would tend to make us think that increasing their number and their activity would be helpful in countering the um, cytokine storm and the secondary uh, systemic inflammation picture. Um, Rio Juni asked, do COVID-19 patients with heart manifestations already have a history of cardiac problems? Uh, we um, have looked at that in our own series uh, here at uh, Cedars-Sinai, and there's something like a two-fold increase in um, apparent uh, criticality of patients, um, depending on a prior history of heart problems. But it's not clear how many of the patients who actually manifest overt uh, heart uh, disease uh, have um, prior histories of cardiac problems. And certainly there's a number of cases in the literature as well as anecdotally of patients who present with something that resembles an acute coronary syndrome, uh, echocardiographic abnormalities and chest pain who go to the cardiac catheterization laboratory and have uh, clean coronaries. Um, Marina Anastasio uh, asks, is there increased vascular endothelial permeability in infected patients? And is there any difference between groups with diverse severity manifestations? Good questions to which um, I don't know the answer. Um, I mean, the one thing I would just say is there are lots of questions and they keep piling up. So you probably may stay here until tomorrow. <laughs> so please feel <laughs> free to stop at any point you feel. Alejandro Orlowski um, asks about the use of convalescent plasma. Uh, there's every good reason to believe that uh, patients mount a typical IgM, IgG response, uh, the ones who get better, and uh, hence the uh, enthusiasm over the use of uh, convalescent plasma. Um, there is a small literature uh, that, uh, that is in the less than tens of patients collectively in the world showing uh, positive results in open-label studies of convalescent plasma with COVID-19. But um, so far, the, um, uh, it's all anecdotal and uh, limited. Um, 
So Dabar, I, uh, I, I leave it up to you. Perhaps we should adjourn at this point. I, I think Thomas, uh, shall I just uh, unmute you and then maybe you could uh, guide us in this. I oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, actually these are really interesting questions. So it's worth going through, but it's uh, taking probably a little bit too much time. Um, Possibly. I mean, I would uh, say I would say there's probably time to 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 put a stop because we've been going for about an hour and a bit yeah. now, um, and uh, I I think I would like to thank personally everyone, but particularly Eduardo, um, and I don't know Thomas, but you may want to close and and. <laughs> well, okay. Thank thanks very much. Um, I I also like to thank. Uh, First of all, you, Davor, and uh, Michael, for again, for having this uh, for initiative. It's, I think it was really a great move and it seems to be a success, so I'm super happy. And I think the rest of the ISHR Council shares this view. This was a super initiative, so thanks again. Rom, as well, for hosting it as an editor of the JMCC. And um, of course, Eduardo for giving a great lecture on, I think the really the most recent um, uh, state of the art of this amazing disease, which will keep us busy for the next months. So thanks, thanks a lot and congratulations. And maybe most importantly, thanks to the more than 700 people watching. That's great because you can do wonderful things. If nobody comes, then you are, um, disappointed. So this was the other way around. We were overwhelmed by the response. So thank you all for listening. And please stay, stay with us tomorrow, six o'clock, no, I mean, six o'clock CET, five o'clock Britain, 10 a.m. It's nine a.m. sort of LA. Nine a.m. Okay. So <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in the U.S. is different. Somewhere. In, in the center of the world in Britain, it's 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Manuel Maya. So please stay with us. Have a good evening, afternoon, can I, day. Can I just ask a question of Davor? Uh, Davor, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, just uh, there, are, there are a lot of very interesting questions in the Q and A. Yeah. If that, uh, I mean, Eduardo, as a busy clinician, has got a lot to do. But will those questions be available to people who don't log off immediately? How long will those questions be there? And could, uh, I, could the people, could our audience, if they feel so inclined via the chat panel, contribute any answers to any of the questions they can see? Is that a possible scenario? Uh, so, I mean, once I stop broadcasting, then right. the, the, the chat will disappear and the okay. questions will disappear. But what I can do is I can save all of these. Yeah. And then uh, I've got everyone's emails, so I, we can make a mailing list. And if you like, we can send that around. Um, don't know what. And is there there. any uh, benefit to keeping the chat open for say half an hour? If people want to answer questions amongst themselves, maybe they can. I, I can know. do. I can do. So, we could um, keep the chat open, and if people have got answers to some of the really amazing, interesting questions we've got sure. posted, then uh, feel free to put them on the chat line. Sure. Good idea. Good so, idea. So in that case, then I'll leave the I'll leave the broadcast going for the next half an hour. I'll stop recording. Some people can use the chat, um, and I will save all the questions and all the chat. At the Perfect. End. Fine. Good. Great. So thanks, Eduardo. thanks again for everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Eduardo. Yeah. Want to say hi? <laughs>